Are we rolling? All right. 80 seconds until rolling. In addition to, we're going to have, we got lots of caffeinated beverages as a reward for everyone who came out this early. So simple questions at the beginning to get some Red Bulls and Starbucks Expressos out there. We have... Uh, You don't want me to say hi I do. I was just killing time. <laughs> well, how's that? This is for the benefit of those watching at home. And <laughs> incidentally, time, like 90% of this content is going to be on the screens, not on me. So I don't know if you have more than one angle that you can record or if you just want to switch angles right now, but you're going to. All right. Cool, cool. So I'm very, well, I'm very pleased to have Deviant back here for a second year in a row. Change everything now. Don't worry about his face. It's yeah. a lock picking session. It's his hands. <laughs> I'm pleased to have Deviant back for a second year in a row. He kicked complete ass last year, and I'm sure he's going to do it again. A round of applause for Deviant, please. All right. Th Shit. Thank you very much. How is, is anyone awake this morning? How is everyone? All right, we'll work on getting people livelier in a bit. So yes, I'm Deviant, this is Renderman, and in addition, there's a bunch of our friends in the front row who you'll meet as we go along, and I have to thank all of them for getting me into this and for helping me along the way, because I, I have so much fun with this, and I really appreciate being here. So, without further ado, we're going to talk about some basics really quickly. Can I show a, a quick show of hands? How many people have done any picking before? All right, so we have about half and half. That's excellent. We're going to fly through some of the intro stuff to get everyone up to speed. You're going to see some of the things. Has anyone seen this talk before, either here or at DEF CON or at West Point or something? <laughs> OK, um, so you're going to see some of the stuff you've seen. You're going to see some new shit as well. It's kind of the Dan Comiskey model. It's like you've seen it before, but I keep adding to it, so you keep coming back. And um, yeah, I hope to have a blast. And here we go. Most of you, I would imagine, even if you haven't picked before, know how locks basically operate. You have, you know, if you look at the front of the lock, you just see the plug in the middle that'll turn. You can see a keyway where your key will go. And inside, you can even see sometimes a pin sticking down. The internals, which you may not have seen of a lock, shake out roughly like this. And to start it off, to get some you know, caffeinated beverages in people's hands, I'm going to have you guys help me identify the pin stacks, this two, these two pins here. What would we call, there's two names that sometimes you refer to the top or blue pin up here. Tumblers. What's that? Tumblers. Well, they're both, the both pins are tumblers, but this, specifically the top one is referred to as what? Head. What's that? Head. Not quite the head, no. And I'm trying to keep the sides in view. I know there's some people I'm not seeing hands. You could probably move their seats, man. What's that? No, not the shear pin. Anybody? Free drinks, people. Not the lock pin. I actually said it once. No, not really the binding pin. No? This is really early in the morning. <laughs> not the set pin. Not the ward. Although there is, there is a ward in this picture. If you can identify what the ward is, you get a drink. No? I saw your hand, then your hand. Yes, the driver is one word for the top pin. Yes, the wards are these little protrusions that guide the keyways. Tyler gets a drink. What else? We got, I've been saying the other name for this pin a lot. Yes, the top pin is the other one. So take a stab at what do you think this red pin is? Too many people are shouting, therefore you don't get it. I saw the, actually the person behind you. Bottom pin is one, and do you know the other? What's the other name for the bottom pin? 
Not the shear pin. Someone said that. You owe us a drink. Nope. It, it rides against what when it gets stuck in the lock? Someone, stop shouting. You're blowing it for people. I see a hand right here. Yes, the key pin. So you have the top or driver pin. You have the bottom or key pin. Now you can see right now the pin stack is such that if you tried to rotate the plug in this lock, it's not going to go anywhere. This top pin, the driver, is in the way. It's stuck where the plug would, would want to spin. The only way the lock is going to open is if something is inserted, a key most typically, that raises the pin stack to the right height, creating, some people were saying shear earlier, this is the shear line. And if that shear line is at the right height, obviously the plug can turn, the lock can operate. Now, a regular lock doesn't just have a single pin stack, although we have some for you to play with and you can get the feel of what picking is like. A regular lock will have a row of them. There'll be a whole series of pin stacks and they're not always at the same height like this. This is just to show you what's going on. But the principle remains the same. They just, all the pins have to be at the exact right height so you get a nice flush shear line and then the lock operates. Now, of course, a key sticking in is the appropriate way to do that, but there's other ways we can make this happen. Most people think that locks, this is sort of a top view. You know, these, these uh, pin stacks, they sit in little chambers that are drilled right through the right housing and right through the plug. Most people think, well, you know, they must be in a straight line because that's how they would be manufactured. Now, by design, that's, that's correct. That's theoretically what's supposed to happen. But tolerances aren't perfect when locks are machined. Some, some are worse than you could ever imagine. Now, this is exaggerated, but a lot of locks, you know, they'll, they'll be out of line. They're not going to be perfectly in line. And what I was trying to demonstrate, I don't know if you can see these jiggling. Most people imagine that if you try to turn the plug with no key in it, like, well, all those pins, those drivers must be bumping against the shear line edge. And that's not really the case. Because these are all out of order, these are all sort of wobbly and, you know, not perfectly drilled, at any given time, if you try to twist that plug, only one pin stack will ever really be binding. And you can see in this particular hypothetical, this pin stack's furthest over. So that's the one that's hitting at the moment. These are just kind of hanging out. They're just sitting there. This imperfection is what makes picking very, very possible because it allows us to isolate one pin stack at a time. It allows us to try to manipulate the pins in ways they weren't supposed to be used. And you can set pins, and that's what we're going to demonstrate now. Essentially, if you put a little torque on the plug and reach in there with a tool and start lifting on these pin stacks, the, the one that's binding, it's, you know, right, it's jammed against the edge, and if you lift high enough, that binding pin will reach, this, will reach the shear line. You'll actually feel the plug turn just a little bit, and once you've done that, look what happens. That driver kind of catches on this lip. That pin stack is now completely out of the way you're free to then find another pin stack is going to start binding. And then with a tool, ultimately, it should look something like this. And this is going to render very slowly because my laptop was nicked about two months ago, so I'm running on an old spare Gateway Solo, which animates very slowly, so I appreciate you bearing with me. So you'd have this side view. Now, picking is done with very rudimentary tools you're going to see it's, uh, it, it really couldn't be simpler, and I definitely invite a lot of you to come outside after this is all over, and I'm going to have a bunch of stuff spread out. I want everyone to play with it and realize how much fun and how simple it is. What you want to do when picking is stick a wrench in there called a tension or torque wrench and just put a little bit of pressure, just a little bit of torque on that plug. You then go in with any type of pick you want. This is called a hook pick, and you just start trying to press these pins. Now, remember, this is, these are loose. Now, ah, now this one, that was the one that was binding. And you'll feel that. You'll say, oh, that's kind of sticky. You go up, 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 and, you, and it clicked because I set that. And you keep trying pins. These are loose. These are loose. OK, these aren't binding. And you say, oh, now this one, I felt it a little more. I felt it click again. And one at a time, you know, click, click, click. Eventually, you'll just get those pins all set up. And once you've got the last one, lock pox open. It's not that difficult. And to, to put my foot in my mouth, we'll see how not difficult it is with a demonstration. <laughs> You can do it, Mr. Laptop. All right. So give me some, some good vibes, and we'll see how well this works. This is my, my favorite brand of lock during these lectures because uh, 
they make things a little easier on me. And what I'm going to be using now is just called a jackknife set. It's, um, they're not the sturdiest or best made picks in the world, but it's very compact and I like to just, you know, I always have it on me for little situations. <laughs> Except in DC because the laws here are psycho, so I, this, what is, I don't know where this came from. I certainly didn't have it. We'll talk about laws later if, you, if you're interested in, I'm not a lawyer, but I'll try to keep your ass covered as much as I can. So yeah, here is our little, here's our little tension wrench tool, and you can slip that down into the keyway of the lock. And the slightest amount of pressure is all you need. In fact, I don't even, you know, if, if I'm working on this, I don't even have to hold it in my hand. I can just leave it resting against my, my palm, and that's enough torque pressure to give this plug enough, little, enough tension in there. This is my finger pick, although the lock, you know, the pick does have others. I've actually changed which picks come in this, in this little jackknife set. But the finger or feeler pick, the hook pick, is probably my favorite. And if I reach in here and just try to push, and I can feel a binding and a set, a binding and a set. So that lock's open now. All right. We're off to a good start. Um, yeah, you'll find that this is not, this is not the best lock in the world. Um, there are worse ones out there, but not by much. I invite everyone to try it, and you'll, you'll have this open. You'll have a lot of these open very, very easily. It's, it's just that simple. Locks, in their most basic form, if you just see the pin stacks that way, they're not very strong devices. They're designed to keep most people out. And, you know, they do. I mean, I don't want to, I'm not up here trying to scare you. They, they keep a lot of people away. But your average lock is decorative as much as it is functional. So how do we make locks better? Well, there's plenty of ways to make locks better. A lot of people don't do it because it costs more money, but there's simple measures you can take to make sure a lock is manufactured to be stronger. Locks can have a lot of high security features built into them. Most of these are related to the pins in that stack, but there's other advanced features that I'll cover with you as well. You can have a pin stack that looks like this. This, this is called a mushroom pin. You can see the driver obviously has a different shape, has a cut to it, and you can, I mean, visualize how if I tried to set this the way I've been describing, if I put a little torque and start lifting these pin stacks, I'm going to hang up on that lip, and it gets a lot harder. Even more difficult than that can be spool pins. You know, spool pins give you a false sense of progress. You can picture how this, it'll bind normally, and I'll feel up, and I feel that click, and it even rotates the plug a little bit, and I'm just to keep picking, picking, and say, why isn't it open yet? Well, because you're probably hitting a spool pin if you try over and over and over. There's also pins that are called serrated pins, which jam all the time. Was there a question? Yeah, we have we have all samples of these, so you can feel the difference. You can feel how, and there are ways around them. I'll show you in a little bit. Usually, it, the way around it is to use super light, light, light pressure. There's even a special wrench that some people like to use, called I think it's called a feather touch wrench. Yeah, you have one. Yeah, and you can see it's um, it actually has you know spring action, so that the slightest amount of pressure you you give is all that's transferred to the lock. The idea is if you give super light torque and a little bit extra pushing force, you can actually make it ride around the lip and it'll kick it up into where it needs to be. But that's harder than it sounds. So these are, and some locks will have these. In fact, your better manufactured locks, your better names, or the some even like, you know, even Master, who I, I really beat the hell out of, I have to apologize to them, but well, no, I don't, because they don't try hard. You know, Master does have high security versions of their locks, and some of them will be spool pinned. But for the minimum, minimum different cost that it involves, I have no idea why all locks don't at least have one secure pin. Through. You don't have to, you know, secure the, all the stacks. Just do, like, one. Question. It costs, yeah, I, you know, uh, yeah, there's, there's economies of scale involved. If it's, you know, half a cent per unit item, and you're manufacturing 8 million widgets per quarter, Yes, it's a half a cent profit, the gentleman points out, that they're not keen on. But that, you know, if, that's, why we're, that's why we do this. You know, if enough people start going home and saying, well, I'm not going to buy this lock anymore because the one that's two bucks more protects me by an order of magnitude, eventually that will drive the industry in a direction I hope it goes. So aside from secure pins, there's whole different architectures inside of these basic pin tumbler locks that can really add to the security in meaningful ways some less meaningful than others. The first example is, uh, this is a lock by Schlage called the Everest design. And if anyone, 
I'm not using the same questions as this was a trivia question last year. Where, where have we seen this lock before? If you were at, was it DEF CON 10, I think? 10 or, yeah, it was 10. The, the, lock, the LP 101, or the LP CON and the, the DC 719 guys, they had, a, it was called the beer lock. And if you picked this lock open, you get a case of beer. And no one got it, because at the time, no one knew it was an Everest. The Everest design, you can see it's a basic stack, basic pin tumblers. But up underneath, there's an additional plug. There's, a, there's an additional pin under the plug. It's called a check pin. Wake up. Oh. Bad file. One second. So unprofessional am I this morning. Okay. This is, a, this is a photo by, anytime you see these really gorgeous photos, by the way, they're courtesy of Matt Blaze, who I mentioned later. He some excellent work documenting some of these features in locks. This is a photo of the plug of the Schlage Everest pulled out and flipped upside down. You can see this little check pin, which just, you know, it just protrudes a little bit. It sticks into the housing. And unless that is retracted into the plug, it's not going to spin, even if all the other top pins are, are set correctly. Well, the check pin has a little, little bar sticking out the side of it. And that engages directly with a groove, a deep groove in the side of the Schlage Everest key. You can see the groove is you know, shallow. It picks up the, the little pin, and it retracts it upward as the key inserts in. Now, that's a brilliant idea. It's, it was a really creative you know, notion. But if you can see the way to engage that pin is down the keyway. So the keyway, which by nature is a tunnel that you can reach into the lock and, and play with things, sticking stuff down the keyway is a way to, to manipulate these high secure features. And in fact, does that, do you have one on you? Oh, nice. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so this is the Schlage Everest. Oh, is that the, oh, you, oh wow, that's really nice. You can actually almost see, yeah, you can see the pin retract. The pin is, it's, you can almost see if it's kind of, that's the, that's the hole where it would normally be. And if I stick this in, did you see that shadow appear, appear a little bit? It retract in. So that's how the Schlage Everest is. That's a really nice example. That's gorgeous. And there's that key with the groove. Now, it didn't take long. Thank you. It didn't take long for people to realize that sticking things down the keyway would be, an ab would, would be a way to manipulate this. So people came up with a special tension wrench that had a long finger on it. Uh, Peterson Tools is a manufacturer that makes this. Yes, question? Um, I think that's just to catch it on its way in. It doesn't try to just, so the first, so, so it does just pick it up when you first try to jam it in. It gives it, makes sure it, it really caught it. Is that correct, how that was designed? Not only did people manufacture a tension wrench with a long finger, but some people decided, you know, the key does such a good job of this on its own, you can just cut an Everest key, stick it in there, and use that as a tension wrench, and it'll, it'll just pick up the pin and get it out of the way. But ultimately, yeah, so you have Everest security is defeatable because it's accessible where you're sticking your tools. Uh, so it's a nice idea, but it's, it's, it's roughly like, you know, don't, don't break this window because you have to break this window over here as well, but they're both on the side of the building that's facing you. You know, just throw a brick through each one of them. So someone who came up with a different idea that's a little bit better is the ASA company. And the ASA makes a lock called the Twin, the V10 Twin. And it's named as such because there's not just one, but two whole sets of pin stacks. You can see this is your main pin stack. And notice this top, the driver is spooled. In fact, really devilishly spooled. And it has an extra lip that catches it. Asa makes very nice, nice locks. Over here, instead of a side pin, just a single little pin sticking into the, into the housing, there's a bar that runs the entire length of the plug. That bar will not fall inward unless an entire series of pin stacks down the side are raised to the right heights. Pin stacks which are virtually impossible to get picks underneath because they're so low. Only if this pin stack is all set, this pin stack is all set, will the bar fall in and everything operate. You can see this key, it's almost like two keys sandwiched together. These top cuts are very typical. You know, you can make these at your local locksmith shop. These side cuts, however, which operate the sidebar are not. These are you know, special engineered by ASA, and they ship the keys this way. Very, very secure lock. It's very nice. Uh, it's, a, it's a very smart idea. However, as with all things, there's small inherent flaws. 
And this one was pointed out uh, to me by a gentleman named Barry Wells. How many people know who Barry Wells is? Have you seen him talk? Oh, you've got to get to know Barry Wells. I, I would not have almost any of this if I hadn't seen him and him getting me into this. Yeah, it's both of us. yeah, he's a real amazing, real amazing cat. Barry, who is from Europe, where you see, you see most of your good locks in Europe. Uh, people just take things more seriously there, like, you know, security. Um, and it, frankly, the economics are very, the economics are different there. Companies have a different sense of responsibility to their customer and so forth. But a German sport group, Sportsfreunde der Spartechnik, pointed out to him. Did you say that again? It's too early in the morning. Sportsfreunde der Spartechnik? Sportsfreunde. Freunde. Yeah, sports friends of technology. Um, they've, they discovered something. You know, I'd mentioned earlier just now, these cuts are typical. You know, your, your average Joe's locksmith shop on the corner can make these on his, on his machine, his key cutter. Joe on the corner, or Hans on the corner, is going to make these cuts over here. Well, how is, that, how is that handled? The way it's handled in Europe is that ASA divides whole regions into territories where only certain sidebar biddings are allotted. So otherwise, you know, Hans on the corner would have to have six million sets of blanks, just row after row after row. And a customer comes in and he says, all oh, right, I'm going to line this up, and that's blank number 64A-27G, and I'm going to It doesn't have that. The sidebar bidding is standardized, and there's only a few different sidebar biddings per region. I think there may, if you get it down to territory enough, it's only one. So it doesn't play as much into picking. It does come into play with something we'll call a bump attack later. All, all told, though, I don't want to sound like I'm knocking this lock. I really like the creativity they came up with. It almost compares to my personal favorite lock of all. And by the way, I don't work for any of these companies. I'm not sleeping with anybody at these companies. I just I appreciate the technology they make. My favorite lock in general is designed by Medico. Has anyone ever heard of Medico? Yeah. They're actually, they are an American corporation, which is surprising. Yeah, the best lock out there. The Medico pins are... That's just the whole way these are manufactured. It's, it's genius, and I'm so impressed by it. If you can see this key, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, this key and these pins that are on top of it. Yeah, do we have that? I think that's yeah. yeah. These keys are not your average key. The reason is the pins that work inside of Medico locks have these little chisel tips, and they fit into cross-cut notches that are built into the key. So these pin tips, these actually, insert, these actually ride in and rotate and spin on their axis as they're tracking up and down as the key goes in. And only if the pins have tracked to the right height and rotated to the right way can the top shear line clear, a sidebar fall inward, and the whole lock operate. This is a Medico that I, a core that I disassembled and you can actually see, as I'm, it's a video of the key going in and out, it's, it's, it's so simple and yet so effective. It's really beautiful engineering, and I'm a big fan of thinking outside the box like this. Like, who would have who come up with that? There's not enough pot in my house for me to think that creatively. <laughs> a minute. <laughs> so look at these little pins. Look at them all rotating every which way. And you can see this is the sidebar up here that has to fall inward. The sidebar has these fingers which engage with these grooves. And only if everything is lined up exactly right will the grit and it's they're completely misaligned, but the last second when the key is exactly in, zap. It's really really sexy how they make this work. And I just, you know, I love it. Because it's, you know, how do you pick that? The, the short answer is you, you almost don't. The, there's one guy that I know, and it's Barry. And he has one, you know, he and a friend went head to head on them. And the other friend just took ages. And he, you know, he got his open. The other guy got his open once. But it's not something, you know, we, we like to talk about how secure a lock is. You know that nothing, everyone, obviously everyone here knows, nothing is perfectly secure in the digital world or in the physical world. Nothing's ever perfectly secure, but you come as close as you can. This is just about as close as you can come for this type of pin tumbler design. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
the gentleman points out, you know, you can sometimes see these amazing locks on doors that, you know, have glass panes in them and security in the big picture. You got to keep that in mind. All right. How are we on time? Got to move it. Yeah, got to move it a little bit along. We've talked about really nice security for a bit, and we'll get back to that. But let's talk about really bad security again for a while. How many people have used this lock? Yeah, as have I. How many people still use this lock? Where do you live? Yes. Where do you keep your stuff? These locks are everywhere. Um, you've, you've seen these locks all over the place. Every gym lock, every school lock, they're all, they're everywhere. Um, these locks don't really do anything. <laughs> these locks are, I like to say, if, if you're securing your stuff and you say, oh, I'm going to put my, this is, this is what you're doing. You're like, please leave my things alone. I would like them here when I get back. <laughs> padlock shims are an amazing, amazing technology. Who's ever seen a padlock shim? All right. Let's say you have your basic, you know, cheap-tastic combination lock. And this lock has been beat all to hell, so we're going to hope this works out pretty nicely. And I'm not going to shear the shim off. This little three-cent piece of metal, I'm going to stick in this lock. I'm going to drive it down, twist it around. Yeah. <laughs> These are wonderful examples of how bad, this is not, this is not high text, this is just bad engineering. Bad engineering is always very easily compromised, very easily superseded. If you look down into this lock, Everyone kind of knows how this operates. You have, you have the shackle that has a little dog notch, a little cut on it, which engages directly with, let me see, I'm just trying to make, I can get this angle the best I can. There's a little bar in there, and that bar is just spring-loaded. Now that's for your convenience, of course. When you want to open this lock, you know, you dial in your combination, the bar is out of the way, and you open it. Well, let's say you do want to, you know, I'm going to lock my stuff up. You're not going to sit there and dial in your combination again and slap it shut. You're just going to, you know, bang, I'm just going to slap it shut. Because that bar, being spring-loaded, will just get out of the way. Well, the bar doesn't know why it's getting out of the way. It doesn't know what's pushing against it. This is very similar. Has anyone ever credit carded a door? You know, you don't always raise your hands, but... This dog notch, if I can... Always shout at me if I'm not in frame or if uh, the camera, you know, I'm doing the best with this little webcam, but... You have your padlock shim on here. If you slide it down, and you're in place, and you just rotate it around, it just obscures that notch. It just pushes the bar right out of the way. It's, it's no different than slipping a credit card in a door jam, because the spring-loaded bar just feels something pushing on it, and it says, well, something, I, this must be the shackle coming down. I'm going to get out of the way now. There you go. This is such a bad technique that they could make better in a lot of ways, but they don't. Because once again, what does it come down to? It comes down to the fact that when there's three locks on a shelf, one of them costs you know, $5, one of them costs 7 and one of them costs 12 you're lucky if the, America, if the average consumer, at least in America, is going to even buy the $7 one. Because everyone says, oh, I'll just grab this. You know, little Johnny's going off to school. This is to lock his stuff. I guess I don't care. I'm paying enough in his tuition. And that the What's that? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, my turn to talk now. Um, just on an aside with uh, combination locks, uh, you see we've got a number of uh, cutaway safe locks up here as well. Streaker, um, back there, put out a challenge to me to see if I could open up a safe that he's had in his basement for who knows how many years. Uh, one provision though, he did change the combination on it and he hasn't been able to get it open since. So. Whether or not mechanically it's in working order, we'll see. But I'm just going to kind of move over here and see if I can crack this thing in front of all of you people. And either you'll end up laughing at me, cheering, and laughing at him or something. But it, it'll be interesting. But uh, towards the end, I'll be going into safe locks very briefly. And afterwards, like I said, we've got a number of cutaways here that you can practice on and, and check things out. So, All right. Outstanding. Yeah, we have to thank so many of people who contribute all this gear and help us carry it. <laughs> Um, I carry my own. Yeah, I know. 
Um, so yeah, just it, we have a lot of fun stuff. I can't wait to play with it and send send all the parking meter. Yes, fish sticks and red X brought the parking meter. <laughs> yeah. All right, how we doing? We're still doing pretty good on time. Let's see. <laughs> so yeah, these these padlock shims. Uh, they're cheap. You can buy them online in packs. Uh, you can also make them yourself. Some places will offer what's called shim stock. It's you know just sheet metal that's super thin and a little bit springy and nice. Um, I don't know who sells it and I don't know why because we have our own shim stock. It's it's called beer cans. And um, if you want, we just get a pair of scissors and we'll cut them up and just make some outside. You'll be amazed that you can just punch them out in three seconds. Yes. Yeah, the, he, the gentleman asks, he said, does this lock work the same way? Yes, it typically will. You'll notice a lot of keyed padlocks will have a dog notch on both sides of the shackle. So there's actually, there are two little bars that are in the way, a little, you know, angled bar that you have to press, but you can shim it from both sides. So yes, it does work the same way most of the time. A little story about homemade shims. This will be for a shirt. Can you tell me out front of whose house at DEF CON last year, this photo was taken. Somebody knows? Nobody knows? Here's the question. No, it was not at, no, it was not at a friend of Bruce's house. Think of, think of this whole scene. Who's, who's a Vegas local? Often at DEF CON. Not actually. No, he's not. He moved. Yes, Shay gets a shirt. Applaud for Shay. He knows cool stuff. All right. Yeah, this was uh, this was a U-Haul trailer that some friends of his, um, it was Polly Hazard and somebody else, were moving. I think they're moving from Texas to San Diego by way of DEF CON that year, and so they're they're crashing out with us. And believe me, I've done this before. It's it's something that'll happen. Some locks you can totally remove the lock body from the shackle. If you've ever seen one of those, that totally slides off and you can slide them back together. If you're not careful, or if you're half in the bag, and you slide it together upside down. The keyway, <laughs> yeah, the keyway gets a little inaccessible. So you know, I'm I'm like laying in a pool, and they they said, hey, do you think you could take a look at something at this house? We have this problem, and um, you know, we had the right materials on hand. <laughs> yeah, and in about you know, I think it took us half an hour to drive to drive through Vegas traffic midday, and it took us about 30 seconds just to shim the whole lock right off, and it was fine. You know, it all worked out problem solved, but uh, shimming is one of the easiest things you can do on the wide majority of, of locks. S yes? No, this one is so cheap that even though the notch, it is notched on both sides, you'll notice, uh, I'll have some of these locks later, they're notched on both sides just so you can slap it together either way. It only has one bar in the middle. Because this is a warded lock, which is cheap for a different reason. So how do you not let this, how do you not let, you know, the, the junior high school kid with a soda can take your stuff? Well, you want to have a padlock that's what's called double balled. Not all padlocks just have a little spring-loaded bar inside of them. Some of them do have what's called a double ball mechanism, where there's a central pillar, which is cut, you know, it's notched out. And you can picture this, how unless that central pillar rotates, these two steel ball bearings are not falling inward, and this shackle's not going anywhere. Your better padlocks are going are gonna to feature this. They're going to say it on the outside. Um, it's, it's obviously... It's going to cost a little bit more, but it's friggin' it's worth it. You can, oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Shay asked, uh, does the get what you pay for rule hold true even in the American market? It, it does and it doesn't. Uh, in general, anybody who's been around long enough. Was, is going to go out of business if they don't offer something that's worth the money. Um, not always in our industry with software. But uh, yeah, in general, even, like I say, even Master, who I, I kick around, they do offer more expensive. You, if you buy like the $35 Master Lock, chances are it's going to possibly be double balled or it'll have spool pins in it or something. Um, but the only real way to know is, you know, buy like two and take one apart and strip it apart and see what, see what the hell's in there. That's what it's about, you know? Or, or, you know, like, come to us, because we've already taken them apart, and you can save your money. What else we've got? Ah, the, the lock I was just describing. Well, that lock was a warded lock, a lock that was on the trailer. And the reason it was, you see, warded locks are outdoors a lot. 
Warded locks, how many people have seen a key that looks like this? Or, yeah, yeah. Warded locks are very popular in outdoor situations or in, or in rugged situations because the mechanism inside is very resistant to fouling. Uh, why do I call it a warded lock? Very good question. Because wards are little protrusions of metal, as we saw in the keyway. Wards, in this case, are named for the keys. Is this the, well, this is sort of a lever key in general, but yeah. It is? Oh, wow. Oh, it's an, oh, right, right. This is an antique warded lock. Well, demonstration antique. Yeah. <laughs> wrap that around your luggage. Wrap that around your luggage at the airport. <laughs> Fantastic. I have some that are not as ancient and some that we can actually, you know, play with and do things, but that's, that's really cool, man. So what makes, you know, what makes warded locks good or bad? Well, I mentioned that they're resistant to, to dirt and fouling. Well, there's, there's a reason for that. Let me grab a few and we're going we're gonna to play with something. Okay, warded locks inside basically look like this. They don't have elegant pin tumblers and, and things like that. They just have, it's like a latch. It's like a little latch that would you know, secure a gate or something on your house. And you can imagine how sand and filth and crud, they, that can really gum up a pin, an intricate design like pin tumbler. It's not going to really foul up something like this. This is large and clunky and you can have rust in there and it'll still operate. On the other hand, you know, what is this? It's like a latch on a gate. It's really not, there's, there's no real sophistication to this mechanism. The only thing that happens when you stick a key down the keyway, the only part of the key that does anything is the very tip of the key, which gets up in there and presses against this very top, and when you spin it, you know, it pushes that out of the way. The rest of the key has all those other ward cuts on it, just so it only fits down special cuts inside the lock. In other words, if you put the wrong warded key in, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to work. And let me see what I have here. These used to have numbers on them, and they're all but worn off. So yeah, lock number one. And who's key number one? Let's see if I get it right on the first try. No. No. All right. So here's our warded lock with our key that goes in it. And this is, the, you know, the gentleman asked, is it on both sides? This is the one that, even though it's notched on both sides, you know, there's only one little, one little bar in there. And in fact, can we, let me see the angle on this. You can almost see that bar retract out of the way. The only thing that's doing that is the very tip of this key. So if I, say, took this key and shaved it all off for a shirt, would this still work in this lock? All right. He says yes. What else might this key do? I was asking this gentleman, and therefore he can listen to what you just said and win the free shirt if he heard you. Yes. What will happen is that you can take this specially crafted key and now stick it into any warded lock and it'll work. Way to go, sir. Yes, that is, you know, that's, you can buy keys like that. They're called warded picks or, you know, just, just make one. You can just take a key. Either these locks cost, what, like four bucks? Carved out. Oh, here's here's legitimate warded picks, which I think will run you about nine dollars. Yes. Mm hmm. Interesting. I hadn't seen that. The gentleman points out that there is something called right and left warding, where the wavy pattern is cut differently on either side. I've never seen that before. That must be like the eight dollar warded lock. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you can, we'll let you play with these later. Uh, you know, 
five minutes with a Dremel tool, you got yourself a key that's going to open 90% of all the warded locks you'll ever find. How are we still on time? What time is it? All right. Still moving along. Dimple locks. Sometimes you'll see a lock with a keyway that's facing different way. You'll see this flat key. And in fact, if you've ever seen, where is that? I used to have a picture of the key. Yeah, you'll see keys that are flat and have you know cuts like this. Is that one? Oh, yeah. You know, the key like this, and here's your keyway. Dimple locks are a neat idea because it's, you know, it's really hard to insert picks in this space. It's going to be very difficult to get in there and, and get your, and you really can't pick it with traditional tools. But once again, Barry Wells, amazing, amazing guy, has this to say about dimple locks. We're running a little short. I want to speed it up, so let's just let him talk about dimples. Now we're good on audio, I think. Let's see. It's extremely difficult. They put in all sorts of uh, anti-pick pins. It's really a very nasty lock to pick. On the other hand, I just explained to you a little bit about um, impressioning. And there is a very easy trick to open these locks. And I'll try to demonstrate it. Um, on the, here. You see the original key, it has a deep cut, not so deep cut, deeper cut, not so deep cut. And here's the blank that we prepared. The blank has the cuts all, all the way to the deepest, so this key will never open a lock. We even made it a little bit deeper. It, um, all the holes are just a little bit deeper than they normally would get. And what I'm going to try to do now is put some um, uh, aluminum tape over this blank key so it becomes high again, stick it in the lock, then the pins will push on, uh, on the prepared key, um, they will bind, I will move it left and right, and the keys that bind will actually push deeper and deeper and deeper into the foil, and at one moment, hopefully, the lock will turn, and I have an exact copy of the key. And this is a technique that is um, it's possible on almost all dimple lock keys. It's not possible on the multi locks because they have pin in pin and some have to be pushed upwards and therefore it doesn't work on that. But it works on an amazingly amount of, um, of locks. i show you what I do. I put some of this uh, aluminum foil that is being used in the car industry and the heating industry um, over this blank. So as you can now see it's covered. The trick is that the way where the key will enter the lock, it has to be perfect, because that's, yeah, that's where it will probably uh, jam up if this goes wrong. Okay, I'll try to insert it. The pink locks, it'll make sense. Okay, now, the, the prepared blank is in, in the lock, and now I will wiggle it. And this will take a little bit longer than the ace lock, but hopefully the result will be the same. But anyway, if... On yeah. average, that would open the lock. Uh, you put the foil, would slowly shape into the right levels. You go in there, you wiggle, 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 pop. That's how the average... Wouldn't take very long. Okay, there we go. Got it? Yeah. It makes a perfect duplicate of the key. So you can see that that was at either H2K or H2K2. The room just you know went nuts because it's it's amazing how simple it was. How simple it was just to impression that down. It's uh, it's based on that same principle of the binding pin. You know he sticks that prepared blank in there with the foil, and when he tries to wiggle it, one of those pin stacks, whichever is the binding stack at the moment will press a little bit more. He's wiggling the key, kind of pushes it against the pins. Now the ones that are just dangling, they're just going to kind of hang, but the one that's binding is going to push down on that foil. Push, push, push until it reaches the height. And then that's going to set. That's not binding anymore. And whoever else is binding, it's going to wiggle, wiggle, keep binding, keep pushing. And he shapes that, and it's, it's just gorgeous. I love how, how elegant an attack that is against the dimple lock. Yes?
the question was, can you do impressioning with a straight up key? It is possible. It's a little harder because you can see by the dimple design, it's very conducive to this. You have a very nice sort of a, a crater. And if you could picture throwing a tarp over a hole in the ground, there's a lot for that tarp to grip onto around the ground versus a key. What's actually used is like a comb. It, it looks like this very thin comb with little wire fingers. And you kind of put foil or impressioning material in between those fingers. But having just a single, it's, it's like a tightrope versus a tarp. Uh, it is possible. It's just harder to impression. And impressioning a, a pin tumbler lock, a vertical pin tumbler, gets a little more gummed up and a little different. But yes, it can be done. Question. He's using fo foil tape. If you've ever seen, he said, you know, the, the heating industry, duct work, sometimes they use that foil tape. Uh, that's, that's what he used. Now, they mentioned a type of dimple lock that couldn't be impressioned called a multi-lock which is, it's a little nicer. It's a variant on the dimple design. Multi-locks are really amazing technique. They, uh, they have what are called telescoping pins, or pins inside of pins, where these pins are actually hollow, and there's another pin stack inside of them, so that some, I don't know if we have a, I don't think we have a multi-lock key. Uh, Eric, do we have your keys up here? Oh, uh, yeah, all right, we can kind of see this. I don't know if you can see, but these pin, these, these cuts actually have not only deep cuts, but little pins inside of them that stick up. So it's like they're impressed and stuck up in the middle, because the pins that track inside and out of each other, the outer ring has to go to a certain height, the inner ring has to go to a certain height. The multi-lock is a really neat idea. It's a really impressive design. But one of our friends found a way to, uh, to exploit this a little bit. This is, will be uh, for a shirt. Let's see, who can say and pronounce correctly the name of the member of Tool USA who came up with a very elegant multi-lock attack? No one. Wow. You guys could have downloaded the video from DEF CON last year. You'd, you'd know it. All right, well, we'll have a shirt for later. Have a stand up. This is Eric Michaud, a uh, really, really bright guy, came up with, all right came up with an, an attack that I'll kind of show you the fundamentals of right now. So here's our, you know, our dimpled pin cylinder. And the multi-lock, the, oh, nice, excellent. The multi-lock that has that pin-in-pin pin system. Most people say, oh, yeah, you know, the pin-in-pin, pin, that's kind of a neat idea. That, that, must be, that must be designed very sophisticated. Well, it's not really. It's designed like this. Did anyone see the difference between those two slides? Let's look at them side by side. Most people, when I describe a multi-lock to them, have this in their mind. But the genuine multi-lock looks a little like this. What's the difference? Yeah, the one on the right, these upper pins, they, they interact in an interesting way. Most people think that it's just a perfect cylinder tube for the top and bottom pin, and that the inner, inner stack is completely independent. These stacks are not fully independent, and they operate in unforeseen ways. If you were to take a pin, you know, this is the inner pin that normally a key would go in and lift the inner pin to a certain height, and that's how the shear line is met. Well, just because a key only lifts it so high doesn't mean you couldn't stick something in the lock that would lift that inner pin higher than it's supposed to be lifted. What happens then? We get what we call the overlift. The overlift achieved, you know, we've been, we've been mocking up some tools with these little comb type tools. The overlift is the fundamental for the Michaud attack. We're lifting the entire top stack up and out of your way. Now, the inner pins can drop back down, but it's, it's almost trivial because of the very strong angles involved. You can, you can pick those inner pins. by com it, It's really, really neat how, how he came up with this. And all because, you know, who would have who thought that their design would, would operate that way. You can see a real parallel to the digital world, where two you know, related pieces of security, two security methods that you thought were independent, interacted with each other. And a failure of one led to a cascade into the other. Uh, that's something we believe in a lot, is to, to think of the physical world and the digital world not as two separate things. They operate on very similar principles. And this is just one example of that. For two weeks, it's, are you going to be sleeping under something for a while after this con? I actually got inspired by the H2K2 video specifically about the materials I first saw and had an impression of. Wait, tell the, tell the story. <coughs> so 
Sorry, I have fur in my voice from last night. <laughs> Club was great, except for the end of it. But um, yeah, I saw the video and I didn't hear him say except multi lock. So I rushed over to the lock store, got $150 worth of equipment, rushed home, drilled the the pin the, and the key out, and I showed my brother without testing it. I was there for about 10 minutes wiggling. I'm like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> Apparently it doesn't work. So then I saw parallels between other systems. Like, um, did you show the Sputnik? No, you didn't show the Sputnik yet. There's a tool that I'll show shortly called the Sputnik, which um, basically um, is a uh, fine uh, tool. Um, looks like a Sputnik satellite. Basically, um, find wires, push up the pins, and um, I was like, wait a second. Looks very similar to um, overlifting, which was an attack that he showed at H2K2, which is one lock you can put a blank key in and turn a hair and pull it out and turn the rest away because the manufacturer didn't change the bottom pins, so they filled the entire cylinder. So what happened was if you put, lift all the pins up, they were thinner than the top ones, so you're allowed to turn the, the cylinder a degree, drop them, and rotate it. I noticed the similarities between that and um, the attack that the Sputnik did, so I put the two and two together. But um, that only took after um, two weeks of sleeping under my desk and um, not paying attention to a video. So um, that's basically how I came up with it. And um, I don't know, it was really elegant design that came out. I actually told Multilock when I published it on, uh, you can find the paper on crypto.com um, through the main page. I told them how to do it and they got really pissy. And I said, well, I'm not asking for anything. I just want you guys to know this, giving you the heads up. And um, they, of course, asked me to take the paper down. But I said, well, it's on my site. I can't do that. <laughs> So um, they said, well, all right, we'll respond to you. So the president called me um, on the phone. We talked. He said, well, here's this thing. This is why it shouldn't work. And I'm like, well, um, no, it doesn't, even if you use serrated pins, because we're not adding any torque right away. It bypasses. Digits. They have um, a serrated pin type. And it doesn't matter. You lift it straight up above it. Does, it just ignores it entirely. But they did say something that um, the institute yeah. They institute what we call a pug pin, which is actually the bottom pin is actually one solid pin, but it does have different heights on the inside of it. Um, but uh, they said that we institute that, and of all the locks we purchased, they have only instituted that in the master keyed setup, which is if you buy like a thousand locks and more for a site, which isn't really useful. And um, so far as we can been purchasing locks, we haven't seen them institute it, and that would just prevent the entire attack from working, even if you do one pin, like a serrated pin for a master key. So yes, the, the Michaud attack works on multi-locks and British panties. <laughs> uh, different type of lock. Tubular locks. How many people have seen these? All right. Excellent. You've seen a lot of them. We're going to... Yeah, have you seen them in the elevator? Or the big wine case that's you know up on the floor out there? Uh, we are really sliding on time. So I'm going to try to blow through a lot of stuff. That's, no, no, it wasn't for you. I'm, I'm going too slow up here. Um, you need a special pick, usually. I say usually because not always. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> Outstanding. Was the combination like written down inside? Put the combination up here. He, he put the combination up here earlier, and you can see. You can switch over. I don't know if you can really see that from my notes. Uh, no, I, tilt, just tilt it. Yeah, oh, there you go. Um, you can see I was finding a mark around the the 71 and a half. Combination was 79, something around the 20, and 68, 63. So I was basically able to determine where the uh, the lock was binding, and uh, get pretty damn close to the real combination. So. Um, yeah, I'll be covering how you actually have to accomplish this. Just Outstanding, <laughs> man. You thought about at least put beer in it. It would be bad. It's not, it's not good. No, I mean for me, not for everybody else. <laughs> you get the point of the talk. Way to go, man. All right. Um, so tubular locks. We're going to cover these just quickly. Tubular locks are still just a pin tumbler design, but the pins are all facing outward. It's, it's neat because it's not a standard key type, so pe people are like, oh, this is unexpected, and that'll throw people off their, off their game a little bit. But at the same time, it's a lock where all the pins are right in your freaking face. So it's very easily independently manipulatable. If you have a pick 
something like this. This is called a tubular pick. It's a really amazing piece of hardware, which has all these little fingers on the top that can simulate cut depths. I don't know if we can kind of see this up here. You can simulate different, you know, whether it's shallow or deep, you can simulate all different cut depths. And working on that same principle they use with the impressioning, if you just rock the pick back and forth, eventually the fingers will wear down and it should open. So here we have a little tubular lock. This is actually a lock for a firearm, but uh, we'll talk about gun locks in a bit. So I just stick this into the lock, and I wiggle, and I wiggle, and I can feel them binding a little bit, and I can feel the feelers are pushed down, and that's open. So not only have I opened the lock, but I've made impression cuts that are the right heights for the key. Question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Starting out, you have the picks, pins all the, all the way up. You flush them out to zero, which is a zero or a no cut. And then you just you know, tighten it up, stick it in. I invite you guys to try this later. Unbelievably easy. Question. Uh, this, I think Southern sells these. Does anyone know offhand? I think they're like 80 bucks, maybe 70, 80 bucks, something like that. gentleman asks, doesn't this assume that the locks have to be the same? It does assume that, and in 90% of the cases, they are. You're going to see there are basically two kinds of tubular locks in the world. There's seven pin, just like this. Seven, eight, and Yeah, and there's offset. There's seven, there's eight pin, and that Southern makes an eight pin pick. And then there's offset, which is the eight pin pick works. It's just that one of the pins, you know, it doesn't work on the left or the right. It'll just work. Okay. Sure. Uh, one quick bit of administrative, ad, administrative thing. Um, it is uh, on the hour. If you want to go yell at Beetle, we're not going to hold it against you. So uh, he's going to be in the other room talking about uh, the con and doing the whole wrap up and everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see here. Wow, we are so bad on time. We're going to have to fly through some things really quickly. This is just a fun video. I mentioned sometimes you need to buy the special pick. Sometimes, if you just want to use a ballpoint pen and the lock is really badly made. That was a lock. Um. Hey, Evolution 2000 lock. Um, I used to use this to, to lock up my um, bike around here in Seattle until I found out that you take a big pen and just remove the uh, top and uh, just pop it into the, the lock and uh, just do a couple of little quick twists and turns and uh, voila, um, your uh, lock and your bike is uh, completely compromised. So, way to go, kryptonite. Yeah. Yeah, that got a lot of attention and um, kryptonite actually pulled all these from the shelves now. I was going to, you know, demonstrate that but the, I have an old one that I've busted up so badly it doesn't work anymore. And in, to their credit, well, maybe not so much to their credit, because first they said, no, it can't be possible, and then they really freaked out at the guy who released this information um, for a really nice prize. We were in the bar the other night, and uh, CK3K told me about this really nifty, has anyone ever seen that? You know, the Swiss Army Victorinox Company? They make something called a Swiss bit. Which is your typical, you know, it's, it's just a, a really nice little compact knife. But it's also a 512 memory card. You have the one gig one. Well, I couldn't find the one gig ones, but Radio Shack did have a few of these when I was there the other day. So for a Swiss bit, can anyone tell me, show of hands, who released this out and took a lot of shit for it? The Crypto Bypass. No one. Can anyone tell me the name of the website where it was discussed widely and videos were posted? You almost, you take a guess. You can't think of it? No? No, it was not kryptonitesucks.com. I saw your hand. No, it was not Hackaday at first. I saw this hand. It was bikeforums.net. Congratulations, sir. Come on up. 
Bikeforums.net uh, posted this. They posted it after a small article with an interview from uh, Matt, uh, not Matt Blaze, I'm sorry, it was Mark Tobias. Um, when uh, Mark Tobias released this, his interview came out, and then Bike Forums discussed it. And uh, yeah, he took a lot of crap for it, but that's some full disclosure is what we need sometimes to get people off their ass. And to their credit, they changed the whole design. So way to go, sort of way to go, Kryptonite, in a roundabout way. No, I've not tried the new keys. Okay. Yeah, outside. And it, by the way, yeah, when, we're, we're going to try to blow through a lot. We're going to move it all outside. And uh, anything you want to show me, I might even have to hold. We're going to probably hold off on some questions until we get outside because I don't want to. I don't want to cut off any stuff here. But you guys have been. I appreciate you've been really good, just kind of rolling with this because this. I'm not an experienced speaker, so I'm just up here kind of trying to fly through stuff. Has anyone heard of bump keying? All right, a few people who know about bump keying. Bump keying is kind of the new hot topic in Europe, where the German sport group and Barry's group, Tool in the, in the Netherlands, have started to publicize this. It's another sort of simple, easy attack that a non-sophisticated person could do against a lock. Bumping is related to billiards, if, if you will, in this sort of physics sense. If I have these balls on the table and I shoot the cue, what's going to happen? Just shout it out. Right, the two's going to move, three's not going to go anywhere. It's Newton's law of motion. You know, you guys know all this. Well, you can do this inside of a lock. Pick guns that locks pit that locksmiths use. You have a pick gun. Yeah. Pick guns just have this long wand, and it just goes. It slaps against the pins, and you know, knocks up the top pins. If you're lucky, you hit them all perfectly. Now it takes a little practice to to hit it perfectly on, but that's the principle involved. Well, you don't need an expensive, big, bulky pick gun to do this. If you take a regular key that was designed for the lock, cut it down so all the notches are real deep. By the way, that's depth level 9, the deepest cut. That's why it's sometimes called a 999 key. Stick it in the lock and smash on it. You can sometimes get lucky, knock all the pins sky high, and the lock just pops right open. Barry and the guys in Tool, they wrote a whole paper about this. You can, all the links are going to be up at the end. They even revised it to make this attack even more effective. If you take a bump key, cut it down on the tip and on the shoulder, this minimal movement technique they talk about, you'll have a key that can actually stick a little further in. And you don't have to smash across all the pins. You just whack it with the right amount of force, and it, drive, it, it delivers the force right where it needs to go, pops these pins up. It's a really, really amazingly simple thing to do. We have a lot of bump keys we can play with outside. This is definitely, you know, it's a severe vulnerability for a lot of reasons. Lots of locks are susceptible to this. Locks you wouldn't even think are. In fact, we discovered the higher quality a lock is, the more precision it's, it's manufactured with, the easier it is to bump because it's not likely to, you know, to get hung up. It doesn't take a lot of training or time to learn this. It's also really hard to tell if someone's using this attack because most of the time people, we don't have any figures. The law enforcement community doesn't know how often this really happens because typically it's thought that anytime someone uses a bump, someone would just assume that it was someone who had an illegal copied key because it doesn't leave any marks that you can easily, easily tell. So I have a question for, what am I giving away on this one? Ah, for another Swiss bit, the other Swiss bit, who at H2, no, I'm sorry, at What the Hack, just this last summer, who presented with Barry Wells some countermeasures, some, well, if they don't know it, you'll probably win, some countermeasures to this bump attack. The other guy from Tool who was up there on stage, no, and we make it to What the Hack this year, or were we all at DEF CON? Because they ran at the same time this year. Well, I think, Michaud, you might be the only one with a hand up. Who was with him? Yes. Come on up, grab your Swiss fit. Way to go. Um, by the way, if you want to just, you can thank Shmoo uh, for the Swiss bits in a roundabout way because this is the only con where speakers get like our honorarium up front. So I had this hundred extra dollars. So I was like, hell, I'll just reinvest that in the festivities. But um, yeah, Han Fei and Barry Wells were at What the Hack and they presented some really neat, neat information about countering this. Many mechanisms that exist in high security locks will prevent this. Like that Medico, you're not bumping a Medico because no matter how much you bump, it's not going to get that side part to drop in. It's not going to get the axial rotation to drop in. It will, however, make that OSA lock bump because, remember, the regional keys, 
if you get another asa from the same territory, it's going to have the same sidebar. So you cut it down like a bump, it's going to bump the top, sidebar the side, and will open. But there's other techniques that people are coming out with now that can prevent this from happening, prevent this attack. One's called trap pinning, the other is shallow drilling. Trap pins are something you're starting to see more as a pick resistant, bump resistant technique. Trap pins look like this. It's extra pins inside the housing that most of the time don't do anything. The normal operation of a lock, a key goes in, these, you know, the lock will just operate. These trap pins aren't going to go anywhere because obviously the, the key pin, the bottom pin, is, is in the way. However, what if you were to open this lock without a key? What if you were to pick it open? What if you were to bump it open? If you ever open this lock without this pin moved, the trap pin, these are super high tension springs, the trap pin fires down, totally wet, and it's a whole row of them. It's not just a single, it's a whole row, a stack of them. Fires down, jams the entire cylinder, and at that point, the lock is completely immobilized. Now that's, you know, kind of a double-edged sword. It's going to protect you, but the only course of action you have is to drill the door out and get a new freaking lock. There's a different solution in the manufacturing process that I'm really impressed with and I think maybe has the most chance of catching on in the states that prevents bump keying and other rudimentary attacks called shallow drilling. And I really love how this, how this came up, how people came up with this. Your typical lock, you know, I imagine they drill it down with some imperfection in the process because it's not perfect. But that's, you know, you've got the chambers, they're drilled right through the core, right through the plug, and they load the pins in. With shallow drilling, not all of the pin chambers are drilled to the deepest depth. You just drill, 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 and what if I, oh, well, let's drill this one a little bit, not so deep. Then, when you load your pin stacks into the lock, one of them will not protrude all the way down. Now, a regular key can go in this lock, a regular key can lift this to the right height, but a bump pin in the lock, a bump key will not hit all the pins. You can bump on this till you're blue in the face. It's not going to kick them all up. There are locks being made this way in Europe now. It also makes it really hard to pick because trying to reach way up around here onto this pin, you're probably going to bang into these in the process. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous idea and one that would not require tons of retrofitting and re-engineering in a factory floor. You know, you could just set your drilling equipment to randomize which one it doesn't drill as deep. The only side effect is that you can't pin this chamber with a full, uh, full complement of bidding. It, it can only be like you know five, four, three, two, one, or small pins. I'm sure a company could could work around that. It's a really, really gorgeous idea. Who uses these? Not a lot of people. Only in Europe. Maybe we'll find them here. I don't know. Uh, we, yikes! I'm going to really fly. Very quickly. For, do we have any free drinks left in there? Uh, when do you use WD-40 in a lock? Show of hands. Let me see. When, if ever. Yes, gentleman gets a free drink. Gentleman says when it's rusty. The long answer is when it's a fucked up lock and you don't care about the lock. When it's all messed up and you want to just get it open, you can use WD-40 or soak it in kerosene, but then you throw the lock away. There are different types of lubricants. I'm not going to get into it right now. Don't use WD-40 in your locks. It, it gums it up. It might work in the short run. It, it's worse in the long run. I'll tell you why outside. Ah, something I don't want to blow quite fast. Let's talk about firearms for a moment. Um, you're free to not raise your hands, but how many gun owners we have in the room? Do you lock your guns some way? Or would you just lock your house maybe? And you know, If you have little kids in the house, or if you have like you know crackheads that break your window and wander in and out of your house, you probably want to lock your guns. There are a lot of companies making gun locks, and a lot of them are complete trash. Um, can we have, let's see, I wish Noid or someone were here. Mike. Yeah. Mike, can we have Mike for a second? Yeah, yeah. yeah come on up, come on up. Just because someone who's recognized more than me, we have a stage prop that will look like a firearm, but for everyone's comfort, I don't want you taking me at my word. Would you care to inspect this? You'll see it's a solid barrel. It's um, it's not a work. It's a work. It's not a working uh, piece. Is everyone comfortable with that? It just you know. Does anyone know? Anybody? How many people know Mike? He's he's a really smart guy. He knows about weapons. Um, I'm not bringing up a, a gun on stage. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. No, I did not have that in my carry-on. Although I um, I did have it on Amtrak. Which is, you know, it's illegal to have. I didn't know it was illegal to have a gun on Amtrak. You can't travel with a firearm at all in this country on a train. 
but it's not an actual firearm, although it probably would have led to a lot of questions that I'm glad I didn't have to answer. How many people have seen a lock like that? How many of you use a lock like that? Okay, good. Um, very simple design, you know, just slides together. You have these little, these little teeth that engage with a notched bar down in here. However, like we saw with the combination lock, in the interest of, you know, American convenience, am I employing a key right now while I put this together? No, I'm not. I'm just squeezing it together and spring tension is all that is holding that little lock mechanism together. This is a little hook, a little piece of metal. And if I work my way under here, am I in the camera? All right. I can't see because my light is in my eyes. Yeah. You don't even have to applaud that one. <laughs> that is, I don't know what that is, but it's not a lock. It's, it's going to keep, you know, a two-year-old out of your guns, but it's not going to do a lot else. When I had an air gun, I had this lock on it, and I was, you know, like 12 or 11 at the time. It was trivial for me if I wanted to, to pop that lock off. There's other kind. Oh yeah, I said you know. There's there's basically two types of locks that firearm locks are coming. They come in two ways. There's bad and there's colossally bad. This is in the bad category. There's colossally bad, which are just you know like springs and other you know locks like this. They're they're designed for little children. Little kids can't figure these out, but young adults or criminals can. So don't mistake child security for real security. You know, there's the slide lock I used earlier. An improvement, but it was that tubular lock, which took me three seconds. Some people just use cable. It's, you know, I've, I don't know why you would do that. It's kind of inelegant. You know, either lock your house if you have no little kids, or lock them in, you know, a, a safe or a room that the kids are. Or quite, yeah, <laughs> the guns, not the kids. Or quite frankly, you do what my family did, and I, I would imagine many, maybe many of your families did, when a child is young. You don't hide them from guns. You don't hide them from anything dangerous in this world. You say, this is how it really is in this world. This is what this is. This is why it's not a toy. This is why you respect it and act properly. And then you treat them with enough respect and intelligence that, that they're not going to you know, shoot their friends. <laughs> what? What was that shouting? Safeguarding, Safeguarding America's future? All right. Handcuffs, since we're talking about guns, we'll talk about for the rest of the LEOs. Anybody been in handcuffs before? <laughs> Legally or socially? <laughs> All right. Handcuffs are a pretty simple mechanism. You have the big, you know, arm that ratchets around. Inside of handcuffs, there's just this little, you know, this little ratchet piece. And the paw that comes around engages with teeth. When you're locked up, a key is inserted, and it just it just kind of hooks around and it lifts it lifts the arm out of the way, it lifts the ratchet back so that the paw can fall open. It is, however, very possible to shim padlocks open, which is why, yeah. As any officer in, in the room could tell you, let me switch over here. If I'm in custody. I was I going to give this away for yeah. If we have any drinks left, any any, we have drinks. All right. Can anybody, officer or otherwise, tell me if I am properly secured in these cuffs right now? Thorn, I saw your hand first. I am not. Why am I not? Thorn points out I have not been double locked. That is true. Double locking this little pinhole on the side. Double locking is the insertion, if you ever have a handcuff key, you'll see a little pin on the end of it. It just knocks this bar inside upward so that, oh, we have a pin, yeah, I'll go to that in a second. So that not only can the ratchet not move, nothing can move, you have to completely, you know, it, it's really, isn't it designed for the detainee's safety so that it doesn't over tighten as well, right? Yeah, 
Right. It's, it's so that if I'm wrestling around in the back of a car, you know, with no shirt off on cops, I don't tighten my wrists up so much that they're blue, but it's also designed so that I don't come in here with a little piece of metal and just shim it open enough to pop my hands out of it. Um, if we weren't so tight on time, maybe I could do a whole escape up here, but uh, I don't know, maybe we'll have to do it outside. Yeah, no, I'm not going to escape from the real, these are, these are sort of what we call security guard handcuffs. They're made like the Smith and Wesson design, but they are, um, they're not that sophisticated. They're pretty easy to pop out of. Actual Smith and Wessons have higher tolerances. They're harder to shim. Um, do you want me to try it? Do you want me to try to do a whole thing? All right, we're getting, we're getting different votes. Yeah, we'll do it outside. We'll do it in the hallway. Yeah, cuff keys are real cheap. Actually, because I have a video, it's just we'll do we'll do the quick video. It's thirty seconds long. It doesn't take real long to do this. Yeah, this was me at the last uh, tool meeting. Right next to the videos of us getting shot with tasers. This is Deviant Escaping from Manacles. Try number one. Rooting in his ass. Yeah, not hard. Not hard at all. I invite you to try it outside. Just a suggestion, though, if you're ever in the back of a police car and you manage to get the cuffs off, it's not a fun thing to just wave them in front of the cop and, and laugh at them. That's a surefire way to get hogtied. Yeah, don't do that. Unless it's you're socially cuffed. Um, we have some highlights from your collection that you want to talk through and show some things? We're a little tight. We're okay. Yeah, we've been trying to get together and uh, do a talk about this for a couple of years now, and it just never lined up because of scheduling conflicts. But uh, I schlepped about 30 pounds worth of stuff all the way from Canada here to, to show you guys, so be appreciative. <laughs> okay, first one is this bad boy. This is your old antique type of warded lock. Um, you notice that the these warded locks, you know, the key had protrusions on both sides. Well, in this old style, the whole idea is that it's just on one side, and as the key, where's the camera there? As the key goes in, there are um, what they call wards, which try to impede turning this uh, this key in here. And when the uh, what you do is the key is cut so that those wards don't interfere. The whole thing with the the skeleton key that you're always hearing about that would open every lock was that. You just cut out everything except for the little bit that interacted with the latch, and you know it would. You could go up to any lock that that key fit and just boink, pop the thing open. So, um, given the sheer scale of this, I will be highly impressed if anybody can actually pick this. Uh, if you do, we'll throw something at you here, but uh, you'll be able to to bang on that thing. Uh, what else did I get? Um, let's get into safes for a little bit here. Um, a lot of this stuff was sort of acquired at the last minute, so I'm kind of figuring things out as I go here. Uh, with a safe, you have three little rings here, and on the back, you have a cam and a drive wheel. Now, you've probably all taken apart one of those master locks when you're in high school or, or sat there trying to, to figure out how it worked. Well, this is basically just a, a much larger, and much sturdier version of it. What you do is you, you're just turning this around, catching all three wheels, lining up the holes, gates, excuse me. And this piece here, this this is the fence. This is actually what um, I don't have my screwdriver on me. Um, 
But when this piece here goes down and catches onto the cam, that's what actually retracts the bolt. The nose, thank you. Um, mouse down here, you've got, have you got a copy of the paper? Matt Blaze uh, on crypto.com has a really good paper about safe cracking for the computer scientist. That's actually the name of the paper. Um, I learned how to, do, to manipulate that safe over there from that. I've never actually manipulated a safe before. I've only just read the paper. Um, this one I got three days before I came here, so I haven't even had a chance to sit there and try manipulating it. And he, yet he busts that open in front of all of us, so way to go. I got a lot of that was dumb luck. Okay, so you get um, the gates all lined up under the fence. And then if you look in the back here, let's try and do this. Ah, crap. Let's quickly. Demonstration effect, sorry. <laughs> sure. That sounded good. One of the wheels will be just slightly that's higher than the rest. That's what you're yeah. Ready to feel for. yeah. Uh, on this safe over here, this is just a, a fire rated safe. It's not burglary, meaning that as I was spinning it, it the, the whole lock was just jamming against a, a really large difference in one of the wheels, which was giving me very obvious what the number was. Um, okay, I got this again. Um, you can see that the nose now. Because all the gates are lined up, the fence is able to go down, and the nose enters the cam here and retracts the bolt. What you're doing is you're basically feeling, let me just mix this up here, when the nose enters the gate, just ever so slightly, you can just kind of feel those two points there on either side, and that gives you indications of how far down it's going. And since one wheel is a little bit higher than the other, the amount of distance between those two points when the, whole, when the nose is allowed to come down a little further will be smaller. And you'll be able to feel that and map it out on a graph or just notes as I was doing and tell roughly where the gates are on the wheels. So uh, We've got three locks here. You'll be able to, to tinker with those. And it'll be a lot more apparent when you actually see it in, out, in action as you're handling it. This one's probably my favorite. This is what they call a lever lock. Now, a lever lock is actually still it is one of the oldest designs and still in use. You see a lot of them in uh, safe deposit boxes. This is actually, I think, came out of a old uh, prison door, I think. I don't know. I just end up, uh, no, I did not go there and actually acquire it. Um, but each one of these levers is just, ha. Huh. That's a safe deposit. Oh, you didn't tell me you had this. <laughs> Um, how can you not realize it? <laughs> As you can see, it's just a spring-loaded piece of brass, and the bolt here slides through the channel in the middle. Now, um, with that bolt, it can't, you, you have to move the lever to the right level. Like the key comes in here, pushes against here, and when it gets to the right level, the bolt's allowed to slide. Now you can see that if you're having to pick this, you're having to push each one, you know, get the bolt to jam ever so slightly, and then the next one. These things are a right pain because there's a lot of tension on here. Normal tools won't work. And what Debian had here, and I don't want to know why you have a safe deposit lock. Thank uh, Louis for eBaying, man. Yeah, he found cool. a ton of them. Um, but this is what uh, the keys look like for these things. Uh, instead of actually pushing pins up, what you're doing is you're just going in and lifting up on each one of these individual levers. 
So those are kind of neat. You'll be able to, to tear that apart outside here. Or have to run to man shoes for his own security. That's exactly where I'm going. The question that we're usually asked at these things is, what do you have in your, you know, what do you do? All, we're, we're saying all these locks are craptacular. Most people have a quick set or a wiser on their front door right now. What do you do? What do you have on your front door? Well, Deviant likes the Medico, but the problem is with the Medicos is they're like a hundred bucks or more per cylinder. And for the home, that's, that's getting a little bit up there. The one I personally use is called Scorpion CX-5. Um, I'm not sure if there's any distributors in the States right now. Uh, I know that they're trying. What it is is, no, this is not actually my key. I'm not that dumb. <laughs> but it, it's a key. Yeah. It's a, a good size key. It's a restricted blank, meaning no Joe Schmo can just walk into a Home Depot and get, the, 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 uh, get a blank for this. But you also see that there's this little worm cut in the side here. And what that does is it interacts with a sidebar inside the lock, lifting pins up into the right spot so that the bar can fall in. But the neat thing is that those pins have no springs. They're gravity fed because the little finger that goes in and gets into this worm groove um, lifts and, every, uh, lifts and uh, positions the pin. You don't have to have a spring. So to try to pick this, there's no resistance or anything for you to feel. Um, these cylinders were running about 30 bucks a piece, which when you start looking at what's in Home Depot, it's quite competitive and you've got a much higher security. This is a grade two lock, whereas most house locks are grade three. So it's just going to put up a, a heck of a lot more. And I actually have a cutaway of it here that uh, if it goes missing, I will personally inspect every one of your crevices because <laughs> I will lose limbs if I don't get this back. But you can see how, um, <laughs> you, you could, well, I guess you could try to see how. But outside, you'll be able to see how uh, the sidebar works and just how you can go for a really high security lock in your own home, and you don't have to totally bust the bank. But then again, you also have to think, if I'm putting in a really high security lock, am I putting this in like a hollow core wood door that you could just put a boot through? You know, myself, I went out and spent a little extra money and got steel clad door, you know, insulation, um, partially for insulation, but the other thing was, well, you know, the, the 1970s hollow core wood door that was there, you know, it just didn't give you a good sense of security, so. Um, anything else? Oh, okay. We're still pretty good on time, too. We're all right. We're only about 10 minutes behind. <laughs> Matt Blaze's response to the question of what kind of locks do you have on your house is ones that are slightly better than my neighbors. Right, because um, like Thorne and uh, any other cop can tell you, uh, the average attack you're going to get against your house and your possession, unless you have three-letter agencies coming after you, is is not going to be the, the pick attack. It's going to be the boot to the door or the brick. Something, I think the figures are like half of all larceny and theft crimes are, you know, like it's a junkie, basically, who's just trying to scam something quick to, to get money. I'm going to, we're a little bit back. I, is it quick? Is it a real quick question? <coughs> What's that? Mm-hmm. The side cut keys? Yeah. Show me outside, and we'll talk about them outside. Uh, just one other thing that uh, I'd like to show off, and yeah, th there's a guy by the name of Ramundo on the Lockpicking 101 forums who makes his own lockpicks, like he designs them himself, just out of his basement. This guy is, is not a professional or anything. But this guy, this is what they call a Bogota rake. Um, turn a little bit. You can see that each one of the, the highs and lows on this rake are approximately the distance between a pin. So what he's do, done is basically come up with a way of you, you take this, jam it in, move it up and down, all around, and you're quickly simulating a large number of keys. And this is a freaky tool because what you do is you just, you know, tension a wrench. You can act as a tension wrench too, right? Yeah, you two of them. you've got two of them here. And you basically just go in and, and start jamming around, and you know the, the thing will pop right open for you. Demonstration effect. I'm not even going to try, but um, var, um, v a r j e a l dot com, vargel dot com, um, actually has some of these for sale. Ramundo doesn't sell directly to the public. You basically have to get on his good side first. 
but uh, Vargel does have some in limited supply, so um, I would highly recommend these. Uh, I actually carry a set pinned up in my hat, um, just as a, a, a backup set to have around. And uh, TSA actually let me through on two flights with these accidentally. I forgot they were there. <laughs> so I will be taking those out on the way home just in case anybody's you know, phoning back to the office before I leave. Um, V-A-R-J-E-A-L dot com. All right. So. All right. All right. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Renderman, for bringing all this extra goodness. Yeah, and I should mention, just as much as I love uh, Medicos, I don't have a Medico in my door. I don't have nearly as nice, uh, you know, I have just a solid, a very heavy door, and um, a Mossberg 590. <laughs> real, real quick, master keying theory. Um, this was covered other times I've talked. Some of you may have seen it. If not, we're going to knock through it real fast. Not master the brand, but master as in like the multiple lock system where different levels of privilege are d deployed across a wide array of locks across a whole lot of areas. Master pinning works like this. There's extra pins called master wafers into the pin stack. And look that from the side. You'll have a lock that's pinned out something like this so that all the red pins, all the, the key, and you know these aren't the real colors, by the way. Don't go home being like, hey, my locks are brass. No, these are just for demonstration. Um, yeah. All the key pins are different in every door so that everyone can be issued you know, a, a basic, their own key. But in every door, the combination, the additive combination of the bottom key pin and the master pin adds up to the same number so that you can have a user's key, the lowest key on a totem pole. Do we have free drinks? Show of hands, what's the lowest key in a mastered system called? Not a user key. I saw your hand. Go ahead. No, not a master key. That's the, not a base key. Are there people way on the sides I'm missing? No. Not a slave. No, just start shouting. Anybody know? No. It's called a change key. Uh, you can, like, freak a locksmith out if you know that and you're not supposed to. But locksmiths are real guarded with a lot of this info. We, we get dirty looks sometimes for being up here. So, yeah, the change key, the user's key, is just pinned out like this versus a master key or the top master key, which is mastered for the whole building. It's pinned out like this so that everywhere in the building, the combination of, you know, m master pins and bottom pins all work out. Well, there's a very interesting attack that you can leverage against these locks that can let you turn your change key into a master key. And many of us did this in college. But, of course, many of other of others of us, <laughs> not me. Um, let's say you have a, a key. You know, this is the key that came to your dorm room. What you want to do is take it, you just want to file down one of the bidding cuts. Just, just file it down some. And, you know, then you're, you're pretty much fucked because you can't open your door. <laughs> so you say, what did I get into? Well, nowhere to go but down. Can't build brass back up. So you keep filing your key down. Keep filing your key down. Eventually, your key is going to pop that door open. And you say, well, it's not the same key I was given. I've changed my key. I've altered it. What you have made is an intermediate master key. You've hit the master shear line for this one pin stack. You do that to the next one, and you do that to the next one, and you do that to the next one, and in a very short amount of time, you've got yourself the grand master key or the top master key, depending on how the system is, is put together for the entire complex. There are mastering systems that prevent this attack. Most of them do not. Uh, in fact, it's been a guarded secret in the locksmithing industry for years because they would be called out on these expensive, you know, high-ticket job. Picture who has, you know, big enterprise-wide master-deployed systems, like a university. And someone says, I don't know, we, we fired this guy, and he went away with his keys, or this guy got hit by a bus or abducted in the night by aliens. And we, we don't have the top master key. What do we do? And they say, well, this is kind of, that's quite a, quite a task here. And they give this high-ticket job. This is what they do. They say, leave me in this one room for a few minutes. I'm going to check my tools. And they file one down, and they, they charge an arm and a leg. They've used this, locksmiths have used this for years to recover lost master keys. Yeah. So they don't like us talking about that. Yeah, it's easier than impressioning because you're not dealing with an unpredictable soft medium. You just keep sitting there with a file. Question? Oh, yeah, yeah. I can explain this later. This would be, you know, considered maybe a key that would work 
on one floor of a dorm room for like an RA who has an RA's key. Uh, you know, because maybe this combination of master pin stacks is unique to this hall, but he only has, you know, these pins across the board. You know, these aren't going to work elsewhere. Could, the question is, could you flip them and have it be higher? Not with this type of mastering. I think this is called TPP or total progression, total pin progression mastering. I don't believe, usually the standard is the wafer is considered the master cut. You could, but it gets a lot harder for generating the full intermediate series of mastering. Really quick, SFIC locks. If you have a large wide area, oh we have some, nice. If you have a large wide area, large enterprise system you're trying to secure with mastering involved, look into these instead. Anytime you see this figure eight shape, Best makes them, some other people make them, this is usually an SFIC or an interchangeable core. Very, very hard to pick these locks. Very, very easy if you're managing the physical security for an entire complex. They're really, really nicely made. This is why. You have the housing, you have the plug, and you have what's called a control sleeve. Now this, you can see this little edge of the control sleeve can protrude out this slot or it can retract into it. With a control key, and I'll show you how these work in a sec, with a control key stuck in, you're controlling the whole control sleeve. You can slide it, obscure the, uh, obscure the notch, insert it into the lock, boom, engage the control sleeve outward, and now that lock will function, just, just the plug will spin with regular user's key. The reason is, and then if you want to repin the whole door, you can take, it's very easy to manage the system. It's really nice. Yeah, it looks something like this. These are all the pins. You have this, this dark, dark brown is the control sleeve. So a regular, you know, a user's key goes in, and look at the user's key raises the, the, the key pins to the shear line so the plug will spin. The control sleeve will not. If you put a control key in, however, it'll just raise these pins so the plug and the sleeve, notice these are all across lines, will operate as one solid block, and you can slide the sleeve out of the way. That's how you can eject the core. The side effect, and we can be, there's master pin setups for all these. The side effect is if you try to use a regular tension wrench and put pressure, it's going to bind on all these lines. It's going to be a real mess. You go in there, you try to set pins, set pins, and it's going to set all wrong. It's usually, and Matt, Matt actually did the math, uh, there's very low likelihood that you're going to catch these correctly. So you're going to try, try. However, as there's always a however, you notice I'm showing these little holes drilled through the bottom here. That's because, in fact, the controls, the plug and the control sleeve have holes drilled straight through them. They don't involve the functionality of the lock when it operates, but if you eject the whole core, you can sit, seat it into this little clamp and you can stick a, a punch tool down to eject the pins if you want to repin your system. The punch tool sticks through these little holes. These little holes were a flaw because a special tension wrench was designed that would reach in with long fingers. It would tuck down, it would actually go through the plug and just put tension only on the control sleeve, not on the whole plug itself. So you'd have this long finger wrench that went in, it would tension the control sleeve just on this shear line. Then you go in, you know, set, 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 and it's, it's still very hard, to, they're really well made. It's, don't think it's a cakewalk to pick this, even with a special finger wrench. But if you can control sleeve it, turn it, you can eject the whole core. However, the same gentleman who published you know, this information where I had read about it, he did this. This is their control sleeve. You can see those holes, the, the punch tool holes. He just took a, a Dremel and he carved out you know, really long slots. Now that doesn't affect the function. You can still stick a punch tool in, not going to get in the way, but there's nothing for the finger wrench to grab onto. Now, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm almost, I'm almost positive that Best now manufactures a control sleeve that looks like this. I mocked this up in Photoshop, but that's what I read. Uh, I understand that, that they just completely said, well, look, we don't need those holes. We don't need the sleeve to even be full. There's nothing for the wrench to grab onto, and it's a really solid lock. So a big, you know, a big support, a big thumbs up to Best Manufacturing for thinking out of the box on that. The roof rack locks. Oh, um, usually those are what are called wafer locks. I took them out of this presentation because I was tight on time, but I'll show you those outside. The question, you said roof racks and things. Yeah, wafer locks are different. Yes, question. Is it all around the control 
I'm told, no, you, you can't because the control key is a higher bidding than your user's key. The control key shear line is much higher. So you can't do that. All right, jumping on. How many people are enjoying yourselves here? Are we having a good time? All right. If you want to get more involved, if you want to learn more about this, there's tons of places to go. I'm going to try to point you in some good directions. There's a few great books. Uh, Douglas Chick, who's usually out at DEF CON with his copy of Steel Bolt Hacking, he published that. It's a really great primer. It's sort of a review of a lot of what we're talking about here. It's, sh it's quick. You can read it in like a day if you're a fast reader. And it, it lays down the groundwork. In fact, if people come up to me and they say, oh, you're that lock guy. I want to get into that. And I'm like, I don't know you, and I'm going this way. Here, read this. Um, so you know, I'll just toss this book at them. And it's a really nice intro. The other side of the coin is like the lockpick Bible of sorts is Mark Tobias's Lock Safes and Security. I own a copy. It's, I, I actually own a copy of this. It's not cheap. I'll warn you that now. However, if you really do get into this, it, it, it is the Bible, like anything you could ever want to know. Like there's a whole chapter there just at the very beginning about metallurgy and how um, locks and, and the strengths of metals affects things. It's utterly amazing the amount of information in there. Yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. He's, he's an amazing guy who put that all together. Comes with CDs with tons of images and it's, yeah, videos. Online, many of you may have heard in the past of the, the MIT lock picking guide, which the school now doesn't want their name associated with. but. Uh, you can still Google for it. You can find it. It's another great introductory primer. A lot of the videos I've been showing of, of Barry at his events, uh, he has his whole talks up online at uh, this site over here. Security.org is Mark Tobias's site. Crypto.com is Matt Blaze's site. And of course, the Lockpicking 101 forums. Great, great bunch of people. Very accepting of people who want to learn and show up. Question? The question was about cars and our automotive locks showing up with these new features. I don't know enough about automotive at all. Um, basically, the, the sidebar was designed for automotive cars back in about 19, uh, automotive locks in about 1923. They're just now starting to, to really put them into place. But even then, um, for the sake of saving a few cents and, and making them serviceable, they still do a lot of shortcuts and they're still surprisingly easy to bypass. You start getting into like the transponder keys and all that, and it does add another layer. But still, I mean, people are still stealing cars, so they need to do more work. You can learn more about uh, picking and have fun at sporting events. It's starting to catch on in the States just slightly. But in Europe, there's whole hobbyist groups. There's huge groups. The tool group in the Netherlands, we mentioned the German group. The German group, what do they have, like a 1,000 members in Germany now? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, here in, in the U.S., uh, we do have Tool USA. Uh, we're small, but we're scrappy. And uh, a plug for the club that uh, I run back home, uh, locksport.com. Basically, we, uh, we're trying to come up with our own uh, international club going and get some competitions going. So locksport.com or is it .org? Whatever. <laughs> And if you're, uh, if you're in the, the Northeast, get one of our emails, and uh, we meet in um, a large university in the Northeast area, kind of in New Jersey. And you can come on by. There's a lot of competition picking at events. I don't think we had anything going like this at Shmoo this year, just because we're all so pressed for time. Does anyone notice this was probably one of the greatest tracks of speakers lined up that I've seen in forever? There's been, yeah, big hand for the guys. You know, there's been DEF CONs and stuff where, I mean, well, DEF CON, you have DEF CON TV where we would just myth TV box the entire thing and we wouldn't go to talks. But I mean, the, I didn't have a free minute to spare at this con. I was trying to get to everything all the time. So uh, they didn't, you know, we didn't have a pick table out. But look at other cons, especially ones where people are floating around to a lot of social activities. You might see sport picking competitions. You know, sit on down, give it a whirl, see what you can make of it. Or as an individual activity, sitting in a long, boring lecture, sitting on a train or a plane, maybe not on a plane, um, and just sit there and try to pick. Picks are not on the watch list, I'm told, but they'll raise a few eyebrows. And I get tired of taking off my shoes, so I try to be as smooth as I can. Really, the gentleman says he's had his confiscated. All right. <laughs> So where do you get these? Uh, the short answer is the internet, not 
stores. But uh, there's a few great vendors. Southern is where I send everyone when they're just starting out. They're inexpensive. They're high quality. Vargild, I didn't have him mentioned, but Vargild.com obviously has his. Peterson, some of the specialized tools we've been talking about, you're going to find them at Peterson. And Lockpicks.com is sort of a clearinghouse that buys from other people and re, you know, resells them and packages them up. Look conventions, if there's vendor areas and big cons, sometimes you see the Irvine guys and other people. And this, uh, this is, all these slides are up at home on my website. If you really want to make my cable modem spit its guts out on the floor, you can download this video. Uh, this guy, Pyro, shows all about making your own picks. Uh, if you download it, tell me and torrent it or something, and I'll put a torrent link instead. All right, good. Real fast, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not sleeping with one. There are legal concerns you should be aware of. Find a lawyer and talk to them. Ultimately, anyone is allowed to purchase lockpicks. This is not legal advice. This is just my understanding of the law. Anyone can purchase and possess lockpicks if you meet one of the five points of eligibility, one of which is a, quote, bona fide locksmith. As someone can tell you, a good faith locksmith. This does not mean a certified locksmith. It does not mean accredited or professional. It means you have an honest, good faith interest in picking. That can be an academic interest. It can be a hobbyist interest. Most vendors will have a form you have to fill out if you, uh, I think Southern doesn't, but uh, if they have a form, usually this will be one of the check boxes, and that would be the category into which you fall. Actually having the picks as opposed to just buying them is a different, different matter altogether. Possession of picks can be considered possession of burglary tools, all depending on the context. Uh, yeah, so can a brick and a crowbar and things. But, you know, if you are just a guy walking around and you get stopped for, I don't know, you know, they're doing the fascist searches in New York City subways and they patch you down there. If you get stopped for any reason or they say, are you drunk, sir, tonight, and you're driving home, and they say, what are these? These are lock picks. You're just a guy, you know, going about his business. You didn't look suspicious, so chances are if the, if the law enforcement officers can't prove that you had any intent to commit a crime, you're likely not going to get charged for that. If, however, you know, it's 3 in the morning, you're behind your local electronics store in an alley, and a cop says, what are you doing? And you're like, I'm just taking a piss, sir. And he says, come over here, and you have lock picks. You've got a whole other problem you've got to deal with at that point. And uh, for this crowd, it's kind of relative, I like to mention, other illegal acts can become more illegal if you are in possession of picks. So if people do urban exploration, uh, if you're trespassing somewhere and you have picks on you, it can turn a misdemeanor trespass charge into a felony trespass charge. So check your local laws. Be smart about it. Some of these states I'll talk about outside have laws that are a little more restrictive. You have to be a little more cautious in. Um, but yeah, talk to me more outside or even better, talk to a lawyer. Okay. Yeah, we point out if you're a, uh, a member of ALOA, the Associated Locksmiths of America, a, a professional society, which is not as hard as it should be to get into maybe. Yeah, you can social engineer your way into ALOA. Yeah, mention you're, you're an apprentice, and if you get your ALOA certification, it makes it a lot easier to travel with them. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing online locksmithing courses, which means I post on lockpicking 101 all the time. Acquiring locks, I'm going to blow through this real fast. Don't go nuts. Uh, when you get into this, it's real fun, and you start buying all the locks you can find, and you're going to have 15 of the same lock. Um, find creative places. Look in your garages. Look for old stuff. Ask your neighbors. Ask your friends. There's a lot of places you can get good locks with which to practice that aren't all the same. A I still have a few minutes. All right, we got to really fly through. Um, how does this all relate to the real world? Well, what's real common in the real world in the in the you know computer side is a very elite attack going to happen, or are you just going to get brute forced and you know dosed and something like that? Chances are the brute method is what a lot of people are going to use. Don't buy expensive locks and put them in a crappy door. Don't situate a real expensive lock somewhere on a complex and think no one's going to spend the time to mess with it. Remember that Medico? I said Barry and his friends, one or two of them, can get them open given enough time. If you have a high secure room somewhere in your facility and you have a Medico in the door and you don't have a security guard who walks there maybe once or twice a night or you don't have a camera trained on that hallway, if someone's kneeling down and picking for an hour, you have a whole security problem in your site that's not related to the locks you're using. It's related to your method. What is a good lock? We get asked. We'll show you them outside. 
real shoot down real quick. These are some of my favorites. You've heard about them so far. The Medicos, the Asa, the best brand. Abbas makes a nice padlock. The American, which I'll talk about. Do I have my S? Yeah. Uh, if you really want to get crazy, you can come and you can play with this outside. The S and G, the Sergeant and Greenleaf. Do I have this? Yeah. The the 830 series padlock. These are armory locks. Uh, the West Pointers who are here, they can tell you this is you know what they're going to lock up their artillery and their rounds with. Uh, you can buy these surplus. You can't buy the ones that are right now. The 833 is currently in use in the service. The 831s are all available. Coleman's.com. Uh, they sell them a lot. And in fact, this is one that we'll, we'll talk about later. We've repinned this, so we took it apart. We pinned it with spools and serrateds on top of it. So this is probably just about the nicest lock you can you can come across. Uh, the question was, what are the difference? It has to do with keyways, um, very minor variations on the design. But uh, every little tiny change they can make, they, the government gets first crack at it. Overall, you know, overall you're going you're gonna to get what you pay for. You're going to get, um, you know, just be, be sensible. Keep tinkering, take things apart, and, and know what you're doing. Just be smart about it. Do I want to talk about this? You know what? what are, how are we on time? I got like five. All right, we got five minutes. Actually, five. All right, we're gonna go through real fast. Five minute, five minute talk about this. Oh, it's only. Oh, we have the lunch break right now. No. Oh, room reassemble. So I could bleed a little bit, but I'm gonna try not to. The guys were really good. All right. Uh, I thank the Shmoo guys a lot. I have to thank them for giving me this big slot because they were really understanding. I was like, I can't fit it into one, one talk session, so they, they were really awesome to me. This is one of the nicest locks you can find, uh, the American series. If you notice, late at night in big cities, a lot of storefronts are going to be locked up with American series locks. They're really hardened, very, very resistant to physical and attack. Mouse points out that the car boots, if you have parking violations here in D.C., you're going to have American locks. The American lock was really, really nice, but it had a vulnerability. Deep inside the core, this is the double ball mechanism. You can see this, the pillar that has the notch. The keyway and the key plug has a little circular notch that corresponds to a, a cut up here on the, on the control cylinder. Notice, however, this keyway is cut all the way through the, the, the plug. Peterson made a great tool, and mine I've beat it up so much it probably doesn't work, but we'll try it outside. And you have another one? All right, good. Peterson made this wonderful tool, this American bypass tool, which would just reach all the way down through the keyway, bypassing all the pins, and it would just flick up against the control cylinder. It has this little flag tip on the end. You reach in, you twist, boom, it pops it right open, and uh, you know, it was this big thing. Now, what did American do? Did they get all fussy? Did they try to sue Peterson? Did they do any kind of that shit? No, they didn't. American came out with this, this little blocking wafer, which you take your lock apart, you eject. These are removable core. You install it on top of the core. You put it back together, and it plugs up the hole. And I love this analogy. It's, it's like they released a patch. It's like they released a little hot fix for the lock. Of course, someone patches a system. Someone finds something else. Peterson then came out with the wafer breaker kit which is these punch tools that you'd stick down, you bust the thing open, and it'll, it'll still open up. Uh, American has since revised the design again, but it's you know back and forth, back and forth, constantly talking about this in the open, constantly experimenting and alerting people when there's something wrong is what makes for true security. People in this crowd understand that. Uh, people in the outside world sometimes don't. And they, they hear like, oh, you go into this lockpicking talk? What is? What are you, a criminal? No, I'm interested in keeping criminals out of my freaking life. That's why we do this. Always keep, keep practicing. Don't let anyone tell you that what you're doing is wrong. Um, for those of you, I don't know, how many people said, I'm going to turn this off because I'm in like another interrogation here. How many people said they were at DEF CON? Uh, did, did anybody catch the DEF CON talk or maybe you heard about it? At, uh, at the end of the DEF CON talk, I kind of went on this tear. We, we had this, yeah, this big rant and we were like, you know, fuck bad people and it was a, it was a treat. And someone asked me if I was going to do that here. And I said, no, I'm not going to go off on, on some big bender. But um, yeah, I just, <laughs> I do want to talk just uh, to wrap it up about what we all do and something that I learned at this con and just, just being with all of us. You know, I'm up here playing with all these locks. But like all of you, I'm a computer guy. I'm a network guy. 
And uh, growing up, a lot of us, when we were interested in computers, we probably took a little bit of, of fun and poking at us and, and felt like the outcast because we sort of, we were in this cyber world. We were in this, not in the, that's the real world out there and you guys just play with your computers. Um, I want you to all understand that that's the most wrong-headed notion that you could ever have about what we do. Uh, you never know who you're going to meet at these cons, and that's just not here in the scene. That's like in the hotel. Last year, you know, who was here for God Con when they were here? Um, we, you know, we were like, oh, what are these crazy you know, these preachers going to be talking to us? It turns out, like at two in the morning, all of us drunk, we got, got off an elevator. We talked to these, you know, nuns about full disclosure and the ethics of security vulnerabilities. And, you know, they were into it. They just, oh, that's, I never thought of it that way. So you never know who you're going to meet. Well, this year we don't have GodCon. This year we have, you know, Cyber Amway upstairs from us. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just, it's tons of these young recruits from all over the country who've been brought here to learn how to sell out their friends and family as hard as humanly possible so that they can get their Lexus and their Rolex. And if you ever wanted an example of the, the real world versus the fake world, I mean, that's, that's what it's about right there. You know, what we do, what we do is real. What they do is fake. Fake values, just fake ethics. We are just as real as the carpenter who fixes a roof. We are just as real as the electrician who restores someone's power on, you know, a rainy weekend. Our work and all of the time we spend trying to, trying to do it right makes a difference in real people's lives. And um, I'm just, I'm so... I'm so honored to be up here speaking before you. I'm so privileged to count all of you among my friends, and I just love this community very much. Thank you all for making it what it is.